Hello, everyone. In today's episode, I interview Pia Mancini from Open Collective and Democracy Earth. And Pia is, she's super, super aligned with um, the stuff I'm doing with ETH Commons around systems thinking and transitioning to this game B, this omni-considerate world. She's much more aligned with what I'm doing with ETH Denver and some of the season two um, stuff that I'm going to be doing in 2018 around my podcast. Um, So this is kind of a teaser for where things are going. And with Pia, we talk a lot about how, you know, what it means for us to break out of a world in which the nation state was the primary organizer of things. Um, And that's very difficult because the nation state had such a big um, effect on the the economic systems, the sense making and information systems and the governance systems. And so what does it look like going forward? That's a lot of what we talk about. And um, Pia actually references this great thing called New Power, which is this new book by Jeremy Hymans. And New Power is very, very aligned with um, a lot of the thoughts in the systems thinking world around um, transitioning essentially from nouns to verbs. And so, you know, Pia says, you know, old power is nouns. It's, you know, competing in a scarcity driven society. It's those kind of things. While new power is a current, it's the thing that flows through you. It's, it's faster, it's mimetic, it's those kinds of things. And so that's one thing to look out for here is just, um, and one contextualization to put yourself in is how was power exercised in the old world and how will power be exercised in the new world? And that's a book that's coming out, which is very exciting. Um, and then the other thing that P and I talk about is um, evolution versus revolution and exit versus force. Voice. And um, specifically for Pia, you know, she's done a lot of political organizing in the past and she's just felt for her, she's decided in many ways to kind of push for exit of the current system, to push more for the revolution side. And she's doing that because she felt like when she was operating within the current system, it really affected herself in some deep ways. So that's something I think is very true from a system dynamics perspective, where you just have to be very aware of whenever you're in a given system, what is that system optimizing you for? And you might think that you can change the system from within or whatever, and that might be true, but be aware that the system itself is changing you and changing how you operate. And Pia felt that and didn't really like it. So push more for the, uh, you know, exiting and for a revolution. Um, So with that, uh, enjoy today's episode with Pia. Uh, It's a good one. Hello, everyone. My name is Reese Lindmark, and you're listening to another episode of Creating a Humanist Blockchain Future. In this podcast, we take a systems thinking approach to doing good in the world, and we have a couple different system series that focus on different scopes. And today, we're focusing on Series A macro systems. And these are kind of humanity level systems and trends in our like macro philosophical technological future, where we ask the question, where are we as humanity headed? And I'm very happy to introduce Pia Mancini to the show today to chat about this. Pia is a co-founder of Open Collective, Democracy Earth, Democracy OS, and Partido de la Red. Lots of things, all exciting. So Pia, thanks for being on the show and welcome. (laughs) Thank you for having me. Um, Yeah, so excited to dive in. And before, we're going to do a little bit of like specifics around the things you're working at and also do some like more philosophical things. Um, So I guess before though, like thinking about the things that you're working on, could you kind of describe this kind of future system that you want to see and that you want to live in and then how we'll get there and then how something like Open Collective or Democracy Earth kind of play into that? Yes, so I think that um, what kind of joins um, the dots um, in my work has to do with how we move away from thinking ourselves solely in the framework of the nation state um, and nation states being the only kind of vector that organizes um, our life. Um, And so we are still framed in in everything that that we do, our political institutions and our economic systems are very much framed in um, around the nation state as our um, political and economic, uh, main political and economic units. Um, And this means boundaries are um, territorial, that we are represented Um, by um, where we happen to be living at or where we were born at. Um, It means that having um, access to um, a currency or having a voice in this world is still mainly an accident of birth. Um, It also means that transnational or global networks don't have 
a, a proper financial mechanism or, or an organizational structure because they are not based in one territory. They are like scattered around the world. So I think that my, my the, the the future that I want to see or the or, or the kind of the 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 um, structures that I want to emerge or help emerge have to do with with this with um, new jurisdictions, new social and economic units, new political institutions that are not tied to the territory. Because in the territory, generally, the muscle is the one that wins. And so how we build alternative um, structures and, and, um, and political institutions and financial mechanisms for these, for the 21st century, I think it's like, it's what has been um, kind of my biggest drive force or, or why I do the things that I do. Cool. Yeah, that makes sense. And I think, um, I guess, could you then tell how like, open collective and democracy earth kind of play into that and kind of make that future more of a reality? Um, sure. So um, open collective, what we do is um, we we kind of approach this problem head on. Um, the Our financial system, our economic system is designed for corporations that compete in a scarcity driven economy, right? Um, the structures that our um, nation states understand as being the valid um, building blocks of the economy are command and control hierarchical structures that are based or um, incorporated in one territory. So that means that um, there's a new actor that we identified that we called open collectives, that it's it's the community, it's the network, it's mission-driven groups of people that um, have a shared purpose in life, um, but they don't want to, they can't, they don't want to um, build a command and control structure in order to operate, they're left without a financial mechanism. <laughs> they're left without being able to mm -hmm. raise funds. So think about open source projects, for example. Open source projects is a bunch of people, um, of maintainers distributed around the world that they come together to build um, software. Um, they are they're not incorporated anywhere. They don't want to be incorporated anywhere because that this is not their... It, it's probably not their main um, activity, but even if it was, they still want to be able to operate in this kind of network-like structure where you contribute what you can or what you're willing to at a certain amount of time, but that doesn't mean that, you know, you run with um, the responsibility of being the president or being, you know, uh, um, of having equity. Um, and so Open Collective, what we do is we enable all of this type of um uh, organizations, new organizations, new associations that we called open collectives to have an um, to be able to raise money without needing to create their own legal entity um, in order to do it or have their own bank account. Cool, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of a transition away from these more kind of core traditional institution structures, things like nation states, things like companies, into a new kind of one that's like an open collective that is able to raise funds and is able to like kind of work in a more permissionless right. way. Um, exactly. I always, I always say the same thing, but like it, it, expecting like our generation to to build this kind of, of hierarchical organizations in order to operate is like asking who's the president of the internet. Mm -hmm, yep. it's, <laughs> right? It's equally ridiculous. There's no president of the internet. Like, why would an open source project have a president or or, or legal counsel or or why a community of people that are just hacking together solutions for climate change from around the world are forced to have. Um, to deal with accountants or like mm -hmm. there's there's so much friction in order for these communities to operate that there's like a lot of amazing ideas that just don't happen in the world because they're blocked by trying to fit um, circles, you know, world designed for triangles. Yes, exactly. And I, I personally have experienced some of this firsthand as I'm kind of, I, I have both a Patreon and also this thing called a stake tree, which is like this new like Ethereum based um, crowdfunding platform. And like with both of them, it's like, oh man, do I need to be a nonprofit? And like, uh, also I'm giving the nonprofits. So like, how does that work with taxes? And like, how does my cryptocurrency work with taxes? And it's like, <laughs> so that's all going to be said. So that all makes sense. So what about democracy? Earth. How does Democracy Earth play into this vision? So um, Democracy Earth comes um, on the um, governance side of, 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 of things. Um, so essentially our proposal with Democracy Earth is that, again, we are, we are, we are represented by, um, by 
I mean, our, our, so the way our democracies are organized means that we essentially outsource our citizenship on someone else, like outsource all of our decision making on a very small group of professional citizens that we call representatives, yep. even though representation is a very contested word here. Um, and we are represented by where, you know, we're living or we were happen to be born at with for all topics, everything, right? They decide on everything. Um, and it kind of blows my mind, for example, that I'm represented in climate change talks by Argentina, where I was born and not by, and I can't choose to be represented by Costa Rica, that they have a much more progressive energy policy, right? Mm -hmm. That's insane in the 21st century. Like it's ridiculous that we keep operating based on territorial constraints. Um, and, um, and so Democracy Earth is a liquid democracy um, protocol where you, our proposal is that you can choose anyone in the world to represent you for certain topics. So I can choose you to represent me for matters regarding, I don't know, healthcare, right? Or, or, or I can choose someone else to represent me for all um, climate change discussions. And I can choose someone else to delegate my power on for um, immigration or forced migration solutions. Um, so the, Democracy Earth essentially is the infrastructure for that, is the infrastructure to create um, global institutions or global political institutions where everyone has a way of um, having a voice. We essentially, we, we, we want to stop the situation where having a voice depends on where you were born at. Got it. Right? And the way, the way we do it is by giving um, a vote token, so issuing 9 billion vote tokens. Mm -hmm. So everyone has access to um, having a vote and be able to to be part of the conversation, and they're not mediated anymore by democratic governments, right? Because in the end, it's our responsibility. We're extremely privileged because we are able to speak our minds, we're able to vote. Um, but, like, that's not the reality for half of the world, right? And it's our responsibility because when it comes down to it, what we are is a network of peers, right? And we are enabling for half of that network of, of, our, of peers are common, um, to be to be mediated by governments that don't let them have a voice, right? So how how can we leverage technology to build like uh, you know another level of the stack? Yeah. So I guess is there a I like the concept of everybody getting a vote, not based necessarily on where they're from, but like so. I guess it does it actually I, I guess it's a system so that when anybody who like proves their self sovereign identity in that system, they then get to do this liquid democracy voting um, mm. where they say, hey, I want to do this or I want to do that or I want to, you know, delegate my vote to this person. And, and but are the things what are the kind of I guess, why would someone want to join something like Democracy Earth? And then what are the things that you guys would be voting on? Are you like seen as a nation state? Are you like part of the UN? Or is like, is your, how is your goal to be seen? You know? no, no, I don't think that none of the above. I think it's like, it's not a nation state. It's not a part of the UN. It's like, a, it's, it's, a, it's a different, it's like a browser, right? It doesn't matter. Like we fly on top of the clunky old operating systems that nation states are. Mm -hmm. Like that's our goal. Like that's, that's, that's the level that we want to work in. Um, with democracy, of course, you can then grab sovereign. Sovereign is the, the main um, platform of democracy. Earth. You can use sovereign to build whatever type of institutions you want and, and uh, execute that locally, right? You, 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 can, you can use it in any type of organization. You can use it in your city. You can use it in your company. You can use it in anywhere. It's, it's a protocol, it's a liquid democracy protocol. Um, the, the implementation that we want to see happen in the world is the global one. Right. Um, and, and so a couple of examples or, or, or just, you know, there's one very clear example of yeah. um, how this would operate. And um, we work a lot and we want to work more with diasporas. So um, one example and one, one of the first pilots that we did was the, the referendum for peace in Colombia. There were over seven million, I think is the number, but it might not be exactly accurate. Colombians that couldn't vote because they weren't in Colombia, mm. right? That's absurd. <laughs> like, um, you know, this expectation that, that, that you need to be in a territorial, in a physical place in order to activate your agency, um, it's old. Um, and so we enabled like, a, a, a different, again, a different jurisdiction, a different agora um, for the... Um, Colombian expats to be able to also be part of the conversation and also vote. Um, 
So um, I think that um, examples like these are, um, are, are are happening everywhere. You see what happened in Barcelona with the government of Madrid uh, stopping the discussion for the referendum. They couldn't have stopped it if it happened online. Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of people from Barcelona that are not, they weren't in the city at the time, would also be able to participate. You have now a government in exile in Barcelona. So, like, how, you know, those kind of examples. Um, climate change is a very interesting example as well. Most of the people that are hit the hardest by climate change are not able to have to 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 have any incidents whatsoever in the discussions, because again they're 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 they're, they're forced into this bucket that is that they're represented only by their governments, mm -hmm. um, and so giving them a voice, giving them agency. These are, are the kind of of projects that we want that we want to see, and. The way we see it is like um, these are sandboxes of political innovation, mm -hmm. and and I think this is I I think this is the way that sounds big, but I think this is this is the way forward. This is what we need to do. We need to experiment. We need to live through um, having agency of, of of exercising citizenship of participating in these spaces. We need to fail. We need to learn from that, um, and so all of these kind of projects are, are, we are starting to experiment with uh, global democracy, with new types of institution, with liquid democracy. Um, and I think that we need to do this. I think that it's, it needs to, to grow or organically. It needs to, um, to be a very experiential process. Yeah, I like that. I think, and, and that makes a lot more sense to me where you have Democracy Earth, which is this protocol which enables these new sandboxes of political innovation and governance. And some of the use cases are these kind of, yeah, they're specific use cases where the government, especially, and where nation states especially, don't do a good job. And I love the diaspora one. Um, I studied abroad with, uh, in like, in uh, Nepal and in India with like various Tibetan exile populations. And that was a difficult question for them to answer and ask was like, hey, how should we as a diaspora people, how should we govern ourselves? Um, so I think that the mm -hmm. democracy earth is a great example for that. And all of this is part of this macro trend that you're talking about, which is this move away because transaction costs have gone lower. We can, instead of having these big centralized top down entities come in and control structures, we can move to more liquid structures um, because we have these new kinds of transaction costs um, or lower transaction costs. So I guess one thing that I'd like to maybe push back on is, is there a, so when you talk about this nation state, um, like, like moving away from the nation state um, as the, you know, main political economic unit, how do you think about, you know, on one in there, and, and I guess you're from Argentina, is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how do you think about like community and how, um, you know, we're kind of moving to this world where we're kind of maybe like bipolar where or like, you know, have like a bimodal distribution where we're both hyper global maybe, and then also maybe hyper local. Or how do you view the kind of power of community or kind of the local side? How do you think about local things within this context? No, I think um, that sort of from, from, um, from my work on Open Collective, for example, like the local communities, it's like one of the things that we also like um, enable the, the most, right? Like, because y y think about um, fractal organizations, right? Networks that have their local, um, their local chapter, their local community, their local organizing. Like having um, one entity per city is, or, or per community, it's extremely costly. So we need to find like micro organizational units that, but we need to enable them to have funding and to have um, economic power. Um, and then they also, they, for me, like communities and, and um, um, cities and, and grassroots um, um, organizations are, um, are the, the organizations that will adopt this kind of liquid democracy protocol more than anyone mm -hmm. because themselves they are they, they are they are um, networks um, and they know each other so there is a lot of um, benefits in, in knowing who to delegate your trust to right because you know that you know the person that was working in a public hospital for 30 years and you know that they have they have zero absolutely zero chance of um, having any kind of lobby capacity or mm -hmm. or agency uh, in in the existing government right but you want to give them your trust because you know them right you you, you want to be able to but you don't want to give it for everything you just want to say hey i know you know so much about this 
we trust you, we know you, we know who you are, we want to give you that power to act on our behalf. That it's super powerful, and I think that in, in these communities are going to be very early adopters of, of this kind of technology. Yes. And, and I agree, I think that um, we need to think about this in, in those two levels of the of the of, of the stack in the sort of super local level and then and the global um, global networks global sort of um, the, the, our commons our glo- planetary commons yeah exactly yeah global problems global issues mm. yeah i think mm. i think women who code is a great example of this happening on um, open collective where it's like you have all these different women who code chapters that are these various meetups in all these various cities and essentially it's a very kind of locally driven very bottom-up organization as far as i can tell that essentially federates across cities but is mm-hmm. kind of very bottom-up driven um so I guess kind of moving to a more kind of abstract lens here, how do you, Pia, how do you think about, so, I mean, there are a couple different options here, but how do you think about something like, um, you know, this one circle of influence versus circle of concern? So this is kind of one that I, I talk about with my friends a good amount and, and have gotten some pushback on. And, and the idea here is, hey, you should only be concerned about the things that you can influence. Um, and, and for you, Pia, how do you think about that? And how do you think about, like, you know, for example, something recently, like, let's say, the uh, Alabama election mm-hmm. or whatever. It's like, you know, how concerned are you about that? How much can you actually influence that? How do you think about this circle of influence, circle of concern thing? Hmm. Um, well, extremely concerned. I was until last night. Um, <laughs> um, I to be honest, I never thought I would be so anxious about an Senate election in, in Alabama in all my life. But, you know, that's where we're at. Um, but um, I, I am concerned. I, I think it's very hard for, for me to avoid being concerned about these issues. I take it, um, I don't know, I take it quite personally also, in a way. Um, and... Um, and, and with influence, I think that um, I was just talking um, two nights ago with Jeremy Hyman's um, about his new book, uh, New Power, with uh, Henry Timms. Mm-hmm. And, um, and the way they, I think it's very interesting, the way they define new power versus old power. I mean, the main framework they use is one where old power is um, a currency, something that you store, something that you hoard, it's something that uh, is a zero-sum game, it's something that you don't want to give up. Um, but new power is a current, right? Um, new power is is something that um, you can't um, put a stop on, you can't hoard, you can't hold, you can't prevent, it's something that takes over. Um, it's like an electrical current, it's like a water current. Um, that's that's what new power is. Um, and so I think that whenever you, I feel concerned, um, I think that even our being part of, um, of, 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 of currents, being, being um, even if it's very minimal, but adding to that kind of wave of, um, I don't want to say wave of change, but wave of... Um, Of power, of initiative, of um, of action mm-hmm. that it's it's happening. I think that's um, I think that that everyone has influence in that context mm-hmm. because the way new power is organized is it, it's in networks. That the the strength is in numbers. Uh, look at the Me Too campaign, right? Like look at what's happening with all of that. The number of people of women that are are speaking up. That happened because there were thousands and thousands of women. And in the United States and now around the world, they're like raising their hands and saying, like, I am part of that. So um, so from, from that perspective, like your concern is obviously huge. And, and maybe it seems like your influence on that is very minimal. But, but a current is made by all of those little drops of water. And, um, and that's what makes the movements um, grow. Um, I don't know. Yeah, that's I- what gets me through the night, I guess. <laughs> 
I think I mean I think that that's powerful. I think I'm reminded of um, the you know when I initially became vegetarian ten years ago and everybody was you know like what that, that will have no effect on the world or whatever. There's this story that someone told me about this um, this person who's on the ocean and she is um, there's a bunch of there was a big storm and all these starfish were kind of um, coming back oh, and yeah. onto the beach and then they're, the she's throwing them back into the ocean and someone walks up to her and says hey why are you throwing um, all these starfish back into the ocean um, it, you're not making a difference and then she holds up one of the starfish and says and throws it back in and says made a difference to that one <laughs> yeah exactly yeah yeah <laughs> Which I just think it's funny but I also I mean I super agree with you that um, leveraging the crowd um, building community that's where power is and in, in, in this new viral mimetic society um, mm. a teal society bottom-up society that's where a lot of these powers are and I think yeah so I do agree that feeling I think that for me sometimes I project onto my friends and say like oh my god you're so concerned about all the things that are happening in the world and you don't have any power over or any influence over any of them um so why are you so concerned and stressed uh and i think that what you're saying is, is pretty powerful which is to be part of some kind of wave um is 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 yeah is kind of this new power that exists so i agree yeah, with that yeah that that's how new power sort of happens in the world by the sort of the sum of all of this and also new new power is very um is very open and at the same time it's like it's like we see collectives collectives like you, you don't need everyone to show up all the time and be there you know nine hours a day and be part of that organization you just need some people to rock up at a certain time and then others to re, you know to to give more and then and um, that's how we we operate. Like there are organizations that 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 breathe, that they're they're flexible. We have flexibility to grow and to um and to and shrink and and not to to disappear before uh, because of that. Um, and I think that that's um that's how we are as a generation. Like we have um a lot of affiliation as a generation, but maybe it's not as consistent as it was before. We don't belong to the same trade union for 45 years of our lives, mm -hmm. right? Or, or 60. But, but our identities are built by several, you know, a myriad of different things that, that, that represent us and, 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 and make up who, who we are and how we, we, we show up in, in the world. Um, I, so I don't know. I, I, I really push back at, at this idea that like our generation is like super uh, apathetic and mm -hmm. or that we don't care and I don't know I just think that's absolute bullshit to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> I think we care we care more than than a lot of other you know previous generations we just care in a different way mm -hmm. right we don't care in the kind of mechanisms that the existing political institutions or or or, or old school social institutions expect us to be. Right, we do, we're not part of a membership organization, you know. But we support five different causes, you know. We do an open source project. We 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 do a meetup. We are part of the we, um we're part of um women's march. We support blacks blacks life matters. We you know it's like it's it's super complex, and the way our identities are built is it it has nothing to do with with what happened, what was happening, or how how previous generations' identities were built before. Yep. Um, and that's, you know, it's a different lens that we need to use. That's all. So so I guess kind of building off of that, do you, how do you think about, I mean, because what you're saying is, yeah, we're, we, we as the, the new generation, generation, the millennials, the snake people, whatever you want to call us, digital natives, we um, are operating kind of this new institutional kind of way. How do you think about, um, something like operating within old institutions and within old systems and structures versus new ones, and how should we kind of how do you think about like evolution versus revolution and what uh, how to get the most leverage? Um, hmm. So that's all right, so when I started working with Partido La Red and Democracy OS and all that jazz um, back in Buenos Aires, um, what we were trying to do was work within existing institutions. Right, we we built a political party. We say like we said, you know what? We are just gonna play your game. We're gonna play by your rules, but we're gonna do this differently. We're gonna have this technology that we build, and we are only gonna make decisions according to what citizens decide on this technology that we're on this platform that we're building. But outside, we're gonna look like a political party, like a traditional political party, and we're gonna play your game. And and it was, I think it was like a very interesting approach. Um, but I think that ultimately, what happens is like the the the, the system ends up transforming you as well. It's not a one-way relationship. It's, it never is, right? It's like, um, 
so we are obviously affected by the object that we're trying to transform in ways that when I started doing this, I couldn't even imagine, mm. right? The way power actually affects you. Because I think that the big elephant in the room in everything, in, in all of these things that at least, you know, we, we do have, have to do with power. And being naive in front of power, like it's, it was one of the biggest lessons of, of, of my life was that power is absolutely conservative. Like they want to stay in power. That's what they do. It's, it, they will, power will always support the status quo because the status quo is power. And, um, and, and, and that has had profound effects in, 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 in all of us because then you end up also by playing the game, you end up playing the game. Um, so um, I still think that it's a super valid approach and I, and I still commend, you know, the heaps of friends that I know around the world that are giving the good fight inside of government. Um, I think that the most intelligent approach, the more intelligent approach has to do with how you build an alternative system that renders the existing one obsolete, right? The, the big um, Buckminster uh, Fuller's mm -hmm. um, philosophy of change. I, I'm, I'm extremely, I, and, 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 and I'm a big believer in that. Um, I believe that it's very hard to change existing structures because of power dynamics. I think that no one that has, that unless you are there, you, 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 you are not aware of the level um, of those dynamics or, or the level that power will hang on to power. Um, and I think that the smartest way is um, it's to build an alternative. I don't believe in revolutions. I think that revolutions are, um, are great for those who can um, have enough money or resources to live through the revolutions. Like the big uh, Peter Thiel saying, like, oh, I support Donald Trump because he's going to bring down, you know, the democracy as we have it and we're going to mm -hmm. build a new one. I think that's, that's great if you have his billions. I think that, that's awful um, for everyone else. Mm -hmm. um, I think that a lot of people would, will suffer if we go down the revolutionary road. Um, and so that leaves us with a third option, or that is building alternatives, building bridges to the existing system. Um, and then bringing people on board. Like, that's what, you know, the cryptocurrency world has been doing yep. um, since it started. And, man, is it working, right? And so... <laughs> Hooray! <laughs> um, yeah, exactly, right? I mean, and of course, it's going gonna, it's gonna, to... It's also going to transform the nature of, of, of cryptocurrency itself because it's a two-way, again, it's like it's a, it's a relationship, right? So, yep. obviously, like... Like having future markets and having like banks involved and having like um, SEC involved, like uh, obviously clearly going to change. Or having institutional money is going to change the way Bitcoin operates, um, but um, or it's going to influence if you want. Um, and that's that's fine. I think that we need to build those bridges. Um, but my theory of change has to do with <laughs> I have a this phrase that is. Um, um, if you can't beat them, abstract them. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. <laughs> and so I think that's what I learned like from the net party. You're not going to beat the existing government. Yeah. They're, they're just not going to change. Yeah. So let's just render them obsolete. How do we do it? We build structure on top of them. We yeah. build a browser, yeah. right? We build Open Collective. We build Democracy Earth. We build platforms that abstract all of that horrible friction for, for, for new organizations. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, and I love the, yeah, I, I, I read that article. It was beautiful. And I also like what you said there about the, the subject object loop, um, where it is, it's a relationship where as you're trying to exist within these old structures, you're being modified by them. You're starting to like want power more than you actually wanted power yeah. or whatever. Yes. You're like, Absolutely. your metrics are different than you want them to be or whatever. Um, and, and I, but so I have, I have one question here, which is, how do you think about, um, so a creative destruction externality is one where when you're building a new system that when you build that awesome new system, whether it's like, you know, creating new refrigerators that have ice machines in them and then the old ice industry goes away or like, you know, self-driving trucks and then a bunch of like the trucking industry goes away and like little towns. How do you think about, I mean, for me, when I think about this macro blockchain shift, um, I see it as this macro shift in how power is distributed and then a decentralization of power. How and, and, and when that happens, all these people who already have power won't be happy about that. Mm. Um, and so there's this big externality there, just like there are job loss externalities from 
automation and, and disintermediation, there's going to be this like big macro creative destruction externality in terms of like this big power shift, both in terms of power in government and also like money and crypto wealth and things like that. How do you think about that kind of externality? And like, do you think about mitigating it? Or like, how do we make it so that it's a smooth transition rather than a weird one? I think it's never going to be smooth. Um, <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, I think that the incumbents are always going to fight. Um, and, and, you know, this happened with uh, social media, right? Like when we were like so naive that we were thinking that Twitter was going to change the world, uh-huh. right? <laughs> um, no, but, but, but seriously, like we were thinking about like how governments w- were going to be absolutely unable to control like all of these voices and people in social media. And, and at the first, at the beginning, it was amazing. Like there was, a, they didn't know what to do with us, right? They were like scratching their heads like, where are these coming from? Um, and then they get smarter. Yep. They start using those tools, right? Um, they get, um, they, they understand how they, they, the, the, these tools operate um, and they start using them against us. And so I think um, as with everything, it's, it's, um, it's push and push back. It's push and push back and you just keep doing and in this game of pushing and, and getting pushed back and pushing again, we move forward. Um, yep. And I don't think we have another option because that's just the way things are, right? Um, again, net neutrality is like a really good example as well. When they tried to kill it with Sopa and Pipa, it was so bland, so freaking stupid the way they tried to do it that it was like actually stoppable. And now they're killing the internet with a thousand cats and we are not being able to stop it, mm-hmm. right? Um, they're, they're becoming more more intelligent, more imaginative. They, they, they also learn, right? Um so I think I think it's a game. It's it's a game of of pushing and pushing back, and and then in that kind of exercise, moving moving forward. Yep, that makes sense. Um, well, just for for what it's worth, I think I hope to make it smooth. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and, and hopefully optimistic. But in any case, so one one thing that's in kind of in pseudo wrap up mode here, it's something that I think is kind of controversial, maybe that I believe, and I'd just love to get your take on it, Pia, is this like whole talking with the other side thing. And what I mean by that is like, you know, um, you know, you're talking about, you know, the Roy Moore thing and how it's like, mm-hmm. oh, there's, the, you know, and, and, and the, all the people that voted for him and, and about these, you know, people that work at, um, you know, the internet service providers and those kind of people. And these are all people from quote unquote, the other side They're the people that you disagree with, that you're trying to actively um, change how they have power and things like that. Mm-hmm. How do you, uh, like for me personally, I really want to, my instinct, instinct is from this kind of leveraging the crowd, building community mindset, that we'd be able to create some kind of great situation where we ha- we talk with the other side in this bottom-up way and kind of empathize and listen and understand um, and kind of come together over shared goals. Um, but I think that's a little bit um, naive and optimistic as well. How do you think about the other side here and how someone like you or how we as a people on, on either side of this thing should talk with the other side? Um, I think we should always kind of build bridges um and 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 definitely um understand i think there's different kind of other sides right there, there's a whole conversation that has to do with um the fracture that's happening in for example in the united states right in terms of race and in terms of um um progressives and, and conservatives and the surge of, of white supremacists um so that's like that's one type of other Right. Mm-hmm. That that's that's another that we absolutely um, um, need to talk to. I would remove white supremacists from the conversation, though. But that, but everyone else, I think we absolutely need to talk to. Um, and but that's and then the other other are the corporations, are the governments. That's a different kind of other. I think that that's expecting that other to devolve power. I think that is naive and it's going to set our, uh, ourselves for failure. I think that inside those structures, there are human beings that are absolutely amazing. And we need to talk to them and we need to bring them on board and we need to have those conversations with them. Absolutely. But expecting Facebook (laughs) to open their algorithm Mm -hmm. (laughs) for us to understand how it's impacting our lives or expecting Congress to devolve power, Mm -hmm. I think that's not going to happen. Yep. Yep. Um, and that's what I was trying to, to, 
maybe to, to say before, and that, that I learned that from my experience in, in Argentina, power is it's conservative. It's the nature of power. There is there's no way they um, want to do um, something else. Again, just to bring back this uh, new power sort of, um, just because it's like top of mind, but they were, we were discussing um, in the, the Obama, right? The way Obama ran his um, campaign um, was ex- was new power, yep. right? Like like anything before, right? New power is like, not I can do this for you. We can, it, it's you. You are the change that you want to see. You are the person you're waiting for. You are the person that's going to make this happen. But then he ran government like old power, mm-hmm. right? So all of that movement that he created, he didn't bring it to government, right? So, um, and, and look, I still think he was like, obviously one of the big best presidents this country had and will ever see. And and, and, and I, 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 I love him, I admire him, but I still think that once he got to um, in power, he didn't devolve power mm-hmm. back, right? Yeah, so I guess I'm making a question on that. And maybe, you know, maybe we're only going to have five more U.S. presidents. So, you know, as yeah, the nation yeah, state goes right. away. So. <laughs> well, we keep <laughs> having them as the one we have now. I won't complain. Yeah, yeah. Um, I guess this is maybe my final question here is, so, I mean, I love talking about power. And that's pretty much for me a sign of any good. Like, if you're talking about power at least once a day, you're probably good. Um, mm. Is there – so something that I have is in, in this tension that I experience within myself is – trying to kind of help the world and affect more people and get more power or, or get more leverage and influence and and essentially power while also being like well that's exactly what i'm trying not to do is i'm trying to actively decentralize power so i have like these weird pledges to decentralize power that kind of um try to help at that do you how do you think about that where you're actively mm. saying right now in this conversation hey people let's not be too powerful and like these existing power structures are bad but you know you're getting more twitter followers or whatever like th- that's mm. power and things how do you think about the decentralization of no, power with no, respect to yourself it's a really interesting um it's a really interesting question it's like one that confronted me um a lot especially when i was running for elections um yep. one with uh, with which i was confronted with um i do not like power <laughs> it's something that I don't, I don't, I don't want um, in 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 my life. I I I it's some. I, I'm not attracted to power. I'm not attracted to people in power. Um, so um, I think I see power for what it is, and and maybe it comes from knowing myself like well enough to understand the effect that it can have. Um, but I think that we need to separate that from. Um, from leadership, mm. right? And and the framework of, of, of decentralized power, that it's power that it's networked, it's in numbers, it's um it's open, it's permeable. Um that's a that's a really interesting um that that that's the power that I want to see happening in the world. Right? That's the type of power that I think is gonna it's gonna bring us forward. Um and I think that leadership needs to happen. I, I, I am a I don't believe in the virtues of like flat soup movements. I think that they are um, we need organizing. Um, I think that movements need organizing. I think that we need to provide some sort of structure. Um, I think we need to think about the governance of of movements. Um, and I think that like what we do with democracy, earth and naked democracy has to do with that, right? So our proposal is not a, like, a flat structure. Our proposal is like choose someone that you want them to represent you. Mm-hmm. And then you can, but you're always, you always own your power. You can always override their vote. You can always remove their trust in them. And you're not constrained by time, which is a problem or territory which is a problem that we're having these democracies, right? I can delegate my power on you and then remove it tomorrow. Or, in, you know, or, or I give you my power, my vote for all, you know, matters regarding healthcare. But when it comes to, um, you know, choice, abortion issues, um, I'm going to vote myself. Mm-hmm. Yes, I, you know, I, I, I want to make sure that, you know, I, that, something that is, you know, very um, important to me. Um, and so I think that leadership is super important. I think that organizing is very important. And I think that it's it's sadly um, underestimated. 
Um, I think that one part of the consequences of um, social media and technology is like all long-term or sustainable organizing has been um, undermined and underestimated. And it's super hard to build movements and, and make them last. Um, and maybe part is because we don't have um, good organizational structures. And another part is because it's fairly easy to get people on the street now using social media. The problem is to get them to stick around. Um, and so so I think that leadership is it, it's it's important, but it has to be a leadership that it's emerging, that it's horizontal, that it's flexible, that it's accountable. It has to be a leadership that operates in, in, in new power and not all power. Um, yeah. Yeah, I like that. I think that the emerging horizontal, those kind of things. And, and for me, a, a key there is, there's part of it is like the decentralization of power and part of it is just like the liquidati- liquiditization of power to al- yeah. allow the ability to have um, exit and voice and things. Um, well, that yeah. Pia, thank you so much for your time today. Um, yeah, it was fun to have you on. Great. Thank you for having me. Yeah. And uh, if you want to check out, if you are a collective that wants to, if you want to fund a collective or a collective that wants funding, you can go to Open Collective um, and and apply to be a collective or to fund Mm -hmm. some good collectives in your community, open source projects, meetups, things like that. Or if you want, um, if you want to try out new versions of voting systems, um, definitely check out uh, uh, um, Democracy Earth for things like Liquid Democracy. And finally, if you want to support me on Patreon, which is kind of like Open Collective, but for a single human, um, you can go to patreon.com slash Rieslandmark. That's slash R-H-Y-S-L-I-N-D-M-A-R-K. Thanks, everybody, and goodbye. Okay.